Spacecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields. This is the second part of chapter one. Um, the chapter is called A Tour of Racecraft. Bloodworks. Understood as kin and as kind, blood inhabits the profoundest layer of mystique that humanity has carried with it from time immem immemorial. As a natural substance, blood is far older than the mystique and entirely independent of it. When Carl Landsteiner described the A and B antigens in human blood, he solved a puzzle. Why transfusions helped some patients and killed others? That decisive work, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1930, revealed natural blood's own profound layers and biochemical properties moving parts that have nothing to do with human groups. The scientifically established universal truth, declared the anthropologist Ashley Montague, fuming over the Nazis' efforts to read the evidence otherwise, is that all human beings, no matter of what creed or complexion they may be, are of one and the same blood. By contrast, metaphorical blood can dispense with the moving parts of natural blood, and has always had everything to do with human groups. When nature made room for human society, human beings made room for nature in society. And blood made in society by human beings has properties that nature knows nothing about. It can consecrate and purify. It can also profane and pollute. It can define community and police the borders thereof. Natural blood never does that sort of thing. It only sustains biological functioning. It is to perform metaphorical tasks. Human beings must carry out those tasks on its behalf. This Nazi scientists did in imagining blood type B, found somewhat more frequently among Eastern Europeans and Jews than among non-Jewish Germans to be a marker of the darker Asiatic races. Eventually, they claim to have devised a blood test for non-Aryanism. In 1946, as thoughtful observers drew lessons from World War II, Montague dissected the popular belief that underpinned race, the belief that blood is equivalent to heredity, determining the quality of the person in his or her social as well as biological status. He numbered such ideas among the oldest surviving from the earliest days of mankind. Finding beliefs about blood implicated in the desolation of the recent war and genocide, Montague reflected on the persistence of those beliefs in the 20th century, despite well-established scientific evidence of their fantasy. He was not talking about the uneducated when he lamented that the thoughts of the great majority are controlled by words, verbal habits, while only a minority of people control their words by thoughts. Indeed, Montague unwittingly illustrated the power of verbal habits by his own incomplete break with the folk notion of race. Blood in the form of words and verbal habits has proved to be an adroit or an adroit stowaway. It crashed the celebration of Inauguration Day 2009. We have a first biracial president, the website of Project Race Exalted, adding that even if Obama identifies as an African American, he cannot deny DNA. Turbulence is inevitable when the concepts of modern genetics fly in the wake of folk notions. What can it mean to deny DNA? If spelled out, the statement becomes unintelligible. Even if Obama identifies as an African American, he cannot deny D.O. Dio, dioxer, ribonuc. I can't pronounce it. Dioxerib, o nucleic acid. Substitute blood, however, and notice that it is instantly intelligible. Even if Obama identifies as an African American, he cannot deny blood. The scientific concept DNA has slid into a spurious synonymy with blood the ancient metaphor of kinship and descent. When equated to DNA, blood resumes its prehistoric character. Only as metaphor may one speak of black genes and white genes or of white and black blood. 
but once invoked, the metaphor launches a logical program of its own. If blood is synonymous with race and DNA is synonymous with blood, then DNA is synonymous with race. Although spurious, that syn synonymy engages a powerful logic in its turn. Invoke a race and the notion of a distinguishing blood stands to reason. In the folk lexicon, that is precisely what race means. Invoke a disease and a race and disease equation becomes plausible, as it did for the illicit research travelers to Juarez, mentioned earlier. If the race and disease equation does not work, a subprogram about disease process clicks on, as when researchers devise the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiment to test the belief that syphilis killed black and white patients differently, though the test involved black subjects only. If the subprogram about race specific disease process stalls for want of data, the input of a drug defined as race specific can easily restart it. The power of this ancient metaphor reveals itself fully when news articles identifying a genetic basis for this or that medical condition are read and even written as if genetic and racial were one and the same. At that point, gene is no longer a scientific notion. It is a folk notion traveling incogni incognito. The equation of genetic with racial slides into research as reported in a 1990 New York Times article headlined, Uneasy Doctors Add Race Consciousness to Diagnostic Tools. One treatment for severe episodes of sickle cell disease, an inherited blood disorder that mainly affects blacks in this country, involves giving the patient blood transfusions. About one third of these patients develop antibodies against foreign proteins in the donated blood, which makes it very difficult to find compatible blood for subsequent treatment. Researchers determined that 82% of the antibodies produced by sickle cell patients were against four proteins commonly found in blood donated by whites and suggested that the complication was partly a result of racial differences. Even a cursory examination of the evidence proves that what the researchers identified was not a racial characteristic. Among Afro-Americans, a minority exhibits sickle cell trait. Of that minority, a further minority develops sickle cell disease. Of that minority, one third produced the antibodies in question. In other words, the antibodies occurred in a minority of a minority of a minority of Afro-Americans. Why call something a racial characteristic that is neither racial nor characteristic? And what if the researchers' sickle cell patients, also black and also recipients of blood from white donors, who, when transfused with what, they re what the researchers call racially unmatched blood, do not produce the same reaction? By the reasoning at work, race retained its explanatory status as a cause, even though it failed to account for the outcomes of two-thirds of the patients. Calling genetic racial simplifies Calling genetics racial simplifies analysis by cutting it off. One might expect scientific investigators to discard and replace a so-called explanation that fails to account for two-thirds of their results, or, if not that, to make room for fresh questions about the ramifications of the disease itself, or at least to wonder whether doctors treating sickle cell patients in Turkey, Italy, Greece, India, and elsewhere experience similar problems. After all, sickle cell patients are not necessarily black Americans. The doctors who first described the sickle-shaped sickle malformation of red blood cells were indeed treating a black patient in Chicago in 1910. But by 1929, researchers had, had discovered it in white patients, documenting its existence in Southern Europe. In 1946, researchers in Tarsus, St. Paul's birthplace, finding sickle cell sufferers with light hair and green eyes, remarked, Negroid features were not observable in any of the patients. Hmm. That's American folklore still calls sickle cell a black disease. In the 1950s, it figured in the vernacular of Southern campaigns to enact blood labeling by race into a law. 
and when Richard Nixon signed the Sickle Cell Control Act of 1972, he first characterized the disease correctly, an inherited blood disorder caused by a genetically determined change in the chemical constituents of hemoglobin, thus affecting the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And in the next breath, mischaracterized it as a disease that strikes only blacks. That mischaracterization enjoys a singular immunity to scientific disproof. During the fall of 2010, a hot exchange broke out at a respected medical school when a white woman doctor stood in a public lecture to contradict a distinguished speaker who had observed in passing that sickle cell was not a black disease. Besides the idea of blood exclusivity, besides, oh sorry, besides, the idea of blood exclusivity arouses emotion. Some Afro-Americans who do not even carry the trait embrace the disease as racial identity. Euro-Americans Euro who do carry the trait in the disease have no public profile. As a disorder of the blood, sickle cell in America has become entangled in the folk notions surrounding the notion of blood as race. A similar entanglement explains the contortions of a young woman aspirant to a scientific career as she lurches between scientific and folk conceptions. Thanks to the knowledge of DNA, she allows, race is not scientific, but she goes on to insist that race may nevertheless be meaningful in medicine and has dreams of studying genetic health risks in the multiracial population. To do that, she must ignore inheritance through parents, a proper subject for genetic study and pursue instead the faux genetics of the multiracial population, a purely political concoction. From the initial false premise, she proceeds through a series of non sequiturs to elaborate her professional aspiration, to discover genetic pre predictors that help identify whether multiracial people may have higher or lower efficacy in response to a drug. If she means higher or lower compared to, supposedly, unmixed persons, she has re reinvented pure races, the core fiction of bio-racist thought, and in identifying the offspring of mixed parents as a multiracial population that is literally sui generis, different from both parents, she has rediscovered a core fiction of folk racism, unnatural neo-humans. It must bemuse any Martian who may be monitoring Earth from a distant outpost to find intelligent life studying nature, learning something about it, and then blithely discarding the results. Lay persons are not the only ones who, like the young woman, conjure with metaphorical blood. Most scientists learn to think within the metaphor long before they learn to think outside it. As scientists, about actual blood might not even a scientifically literate person upon reading decode genetics disclosure about Dr. James Watson's genome have offhanded something like, to look at Jim Watson, you never know he had black blood. That sentence is really confusing and I feel like there must be a word or two missing. But anyway, and of course you would not. Precisely the fear of not knowing has long amplified, amplified the dread of mis, miscegenation, a dread that even now, as President Obama has put it, evokes a distant world of horsewhips and flames, dead magnolias and crumbling porticos. William Faulkner captured the dread and the blood fixation behind it in his novel Light in August in 1932. When a mob castrated Joe Christmas, the pent black blood seemed to rush out of his pale body like the rush of sparks from a rising rocket. Upon that black blast, the man seemed to rise soaring into the townspeople's memories forever and ever. Black blood exists only as metaphor. Faulkner's genius was to convey the metaphor, not by inventing a further metaphor, but literally and realistically. The members of the mob saw and remembered physical evidence that seemed to corroborate what, in fact, they saw only with the mind's eye. Their own actions created evidence, not of Joe Christmas's ancestry, which they never ascertained, but for the blood is race equation. The black blood drove him first to the 
a Negro cabin, and then the white blood drove him out of there, as it was the black blood which snatched up the pistol, and the white blood which would not let him fire it. It was the black blood which swept him by his own desire beyond the aid of any man, swept him up into that ecstasy, out of a black jungle, where life has already ceased before the heart stops and death is desire and fulfillment, and then the black blood failed him again. This extraordinary metaphysics, which Faulkner ascribes to a southern community circa 1932, animated the Frederick Douglass obituary of 1895, and updated itself in 2009 to kidnap a young woman's precious dreams of work worth doing. A similar metaphysics led to a clash between natural and metaphorical blood under the Nazis' Nuremberg Blood Law of September 1935. The law forbade blood mixing but said nothing about transfusion. An unsettling practical question rushed almost immediately into that silence. A Jewish doctor had used his own blood to give an Aryan patient an emergency transfusion. Having a compatible blood type, he saved the Aryan's life. The question was, did the life-saving blood reclassify his Aryan patient? On October 19th, a certain Professor Leffler highly placed in the Racial Political Bureau of the National Socialist Party, dismissed any such suggestion as sheer nonsense, a product of mental confusion due purely to the figurative use of the word blood in the sense of heredity. But the law which spoke of defilement, that is, pro profanation, possessed not confusion but terrible ritual clarity. By definition, a profanation alters something or someone instantly and absolutely. In the paradigm case, from life to death, as both a scientist and a Nazi official, Leffler had his boots in both natural and figurative blood. Therefore, the Jewish doctor's donation of natural blood saved an Aryan life, while his donation of figurative blood justified his being sent to a concentration camp. During the war, donors were compelled to prove their Aryan descent. To the real-world models of Faulkner's Mississippians, such a regulation would have seemed entirely justified, never mind the likely cost in lives. In the words of a Louisiana politician of the succeeding generation, when his state's blood segregation law came under attack, I would see my family die and go to eternity before I would see them have a drop of black blood in them. The War Department appreciated the tenacity of such beliefs. In 1940, the United States, not yet in the war, was aiding Britain through the Plasma for Britain program, and calls went forth for blood donation to save victims of the Blitz. Despite the urgency, some questioned the propriety of sending Negro blood to the British wounded, and even turned away black would-be donors. Their noise accompanied the work of Dr. Charles Drew, an Afro-American surgeon and expert on blood storage, who built and directed the program. His close colleague was Dr. John Scooter, a professor at the Columbian University College of Medicine and Surgery, who, two years earlier, had chaired his doctoral dissertation on blood storage. Drew had taken leave from his post at the Howard University College of Medicine and deferred his dream of training surgeons there. In New York, he worked with the racist drumbeat ever at his back. As the United States readied itself for war and the Red Cross blood banks preparations became more urgent, the War Department silenced the drums. It ordered segregation of the blood supply for what it called reasons not biologically convincing but commonly recognized as psychologically important in America. Indefensible from any point of view, declared Drew, who after returning to Howard University, took part in the fight against the exclusion of black people from donating blood. If wartime sacrifice was every citizen's duty, then giving blood was every citizen's right. The campaigners won the point after a fashion, but the victory gave rise to blood labeling by race. The fight and its outcome soured Afro-Americans on blood donation for years thereafter. Scooter, who took over after Drew's departure, presided over the logistics, sane and insane, of managing America's stored blood in the war emergency. The insane logistics ranged from designating separate refrigerators, 
were labeled themselves therein, and separate days for black donors to do two do you mind queries addressed to transfusion patients. Land Steiner settled in the United States since 1922. Must have felt like an extraterrestrial. Not until 1950, the year in which Drew died tragically, did the Red Cross announce that it had stopped the practice of segregating blood. John Scooter added his own chapter to the ancient metaphysics of blood. At an annual convention of black bankers in 1959, he and a Canadian colleague unveiled a new philosophy of racial blood that supplied the blood race equation to blood transfusion. Among other things, the new philosophy held that transfusion could be made safer by recruiting donors from the recipient's own race. By giving advanced telephone interviews, Scooter promoted press attendance at the meeting and thereby stoked a national controversy. A New York Times headline homed in on Scooter's key point. Blood expert says transfusion between races may be perilous. In the midst and in the wake of that controversy, some southern states debated laws to require labeling or to prohibit transfusion between black and white persons. Dr. W. Montague Cobb, Drew's colleague in the National Medical Association, immediately invited Scooter to submit to the association's journal a concise statement of his premises and evidence for review by scientific peers, a step Scooter had until then skipped. Scooter's argument, later reprised in a symposium in the Journal of the National Medical Association, rested principally on two cases. In the first, testing the blood of a white veteran who was being prepared for open heart surgery had revealed an atypical antibody. Scooter attributed it to the Negro donor who had given him blood during an exploratory procedure conducted earlier. In the second, a black Canadian woman with sickle cell anemia began to have severe reactions after 16 years of transfusion and many units of blood. Scooter ascribed her difficulty to the likelihood that in the city of Hamilton, Ontario, all of her donors were white. The symmetrical case studies, one white and one black, set up Scooter's slogan, unto each his own, his version of the Sunday go-to meeting best for all concerned formulation of Jim Crow. Scooter's audience of scientists was, riv was riveted by the medical issue, safe transfusion and thus by the moving parts of natural blood. In contrast, Scooter was addressing his other audiences as well. He freely inter intertwined his personal musings about the superior rationality of arranged marriage under India's caste system and about the proper breeding of great racehorses. With his discussion of the blood factors implicated, implicated in, the, in the two incidents. When focused on those incidents, Scooter argued that the danger of transfusion between black and white people arose because certain antigens occur in the two groups with different statistical frequency. But the particulars of the two incidents reveal a less tidy reality than Scooter envis envisaged. The veteran in the first in incident had been sensitized against an antigen that Scooter's table showed to be statistically more frequent among black people, 93%, than white, 77%. Drawing attention to that table, one commentator pointed out what would have been obvious to anyone not viewing the evidence through the haze of racecraft, that the white veteran might well have been sensitized by a white donor's blood. In the second incident, testing on the Canadian woman's blood revealed antibodies against an antigen statistically more common in white donors than black, but his own table revealed that she had about one chance in four of being sensitized by a black donor's blood. Furthermore, even then, experts knew the risk of adverse reaction to be cumul cumul cumulative and she had had a great many transfusions over many years. One of the commentators, the president of the American Association of Blood Bankers, identified the key point. Every individual has a complex arrangement of different blood factors, making his blood as unique as his own fingerprints. In other words, the individual, not the group, is the appropriate unit of analysis. 
guesswork rooted in statistical generalization is, is no substitute for individual testing to obtain the closest possible matching of blood. End of story, it would seem. The ban on black blood donors ended before the war did. The commotion about blood segregation quieted in 1950, except in deep south fastnesses, and, and is silent today. Leading American scientists refuted Scooter's new philosophy. A new day seemed to dawn, yet into that new light falls the shadow. The blood race equation shambles from the grave in which Ashley Montague's generation tried to bury it. As George Santayana, Santayana almost said, those who do not learn from history will have no idea what they are repeating. In August 2010, the Atlanta office of the American Red Cross mailed an appeal to black college students at the Atlanta University Center. African American donors, the letter explained, provide the best chance of survival for patients of color with rare blood types, or those who must have repeated transfusions for sickle cell anemia, heart disease, kidney disease, or trauma. There followed a tagline straight from John Scooter's Unto Each His Own. Philosophy. Blood from a donor with a similar ethnic background to that of the patient is less likely to be rejected or cause complications or illness. A tireless time traveler and agile shapeshifter, the blood race equation is back, clothed in the good intentions of a sickle cell awareness month blood drive. Its generous message, come out and give blood, conceals a weird threat because your loved one may not be able to accept white blood. Was there new evidence to support the old claim? In response to an inquiry, the Red Cross forwarded two items. One was a 2008 article describing, among other things, a proposed transfusion model under which sickle cell patients would be given blood from only AA, that is African American donors, on the rationale that an E negative, C negative, FYA negative, K negative, and JKB negative red blood cell product is 93% likely from an AA donor and only 7% likely from a white donor. But AA turns out to be a genetically meaningless category for it includes persons who identify with African American culture or with other cultural groups such as English speaking Caribbean and African immigrants. That English speaking and identifying with African American culture might be relevant to blood antigens came as news to the present author, but most baffling was the inclusion of African in the catch-all AA category, since Africa's peoples are more diverse genetically than the rest of the world combined. The working assumptions of the article seem to be that all sickle cell patients are black that all black people have similar assortments of antigens and that a 93% likelihood of safety is unacceptable because cost saving alternative to individual testing. The authors concede that no clinical trials have been performed to show that such an approach would reduce the rate of alloimmunization. Still a question arises whether an ethical review board would approve research founded on what amounts to a bet that when the trigger is pulled, the hammer will fall on an empty chamber 93% of the time and on a bullet in the other 7%. What would a consent form for participants in such a study look like? The other item that the Red Cross offered was the study of sickle cell patients discussed above, notable for its partly racial causality that proved irrelevant for two thirds of the patients and for the reappearance of black blood in modern camouflage. Equally notable is its talk of matching blood by race or antigen, that is, by either a census category or a natural substance. Another oddity is its junk comparison group, a small sample of non-black patients with miscellaneous anemias drawn from a single hospital. The, disinter the disinterment of that antiquated study prompted the present authors to read it along with the correspondence it provoked at the time. A group of doctors from Spain calculated the rate of mismatched red cell antigens from data provided in the original article. They concluded that racially mismatched blood would not be the cause of the high alloimmunization rate in patients with sickle cell an anemia. 
A correspondent from Memphis wondered why the authors took for granted that the prevalence of antigens would vary more between white and black populations than within the, those populations, when their own evidence showed the prevalence of the C antigen in the white American population, ranging from 68% to 83%. The Red Cross offered no guidance on these questions to the lay recipients of its supporting evidence. And so the tour returns to its starting point, the mingling of peoples that goes back many generations in America. When, as mentioned above, Eggleston interviewed his reliable colored man at Hampton, he listed three sources of the man's genetic inheritance. One-fourth Negro, one-fourth Amerind, and the remaining half white man. Many Americans of long heritage in the United States do not owe their genetic constitution to any one of those tidally bounded quasi-genetic units called races. The phrase, to all appearance, deliberately qualified our description of the dark-skinned EMT in charge of the Creek Nation's ambulance as black. Was he related to the Creek Nation? In fact, his surname, White, appears on a genealogical list of black creeks. Nature need not follow the one-drop-of-blood rule when passing along traits. The idea of a one-drop-of-blood rule for identifying black persons carries no trace of oddity for most native-born Americans. Outside that gravitational field, however, such language can be literally unintelligible. When one of the authors lectured at Keio University in Tokyo some years ago, that expression stumped a group of students proficient in English who were interpreting for their classmates. Although human beings do not actually have some of this blood and some of that, Americans typically do not register the concept as metaphorical. Many non-Americans find it so bar bizarre as to, uh, to defy translation. A Japanese colleague suggested that it smacked of the ghoulish, rather like speaking of someone's having a pound of this flesh and a pound of that. <clears throat> ghoulish fits the eruption of umbilical cord blood into politics, enlisting sensible efforts to collect cord blood for public use and deposit in the national inventory into a political project to create a racial classification. Umbilical cord blood, which holds the same promise for healing as embryonic stem cells, has no business in such company. Blood and state-sponsored racial classification form a political compound of known destructive power. But Project Race has precisely that mission. Its motto is leading the movement for a multiracial classification. Race is an acronym for Reclassify All Children Equally. A 1996 bulletin urged participation in the bone marrow drive, proving that if blood is the soul of racecraft and if the familiar recipe of politically concocted race calls for blood, then every phase of blood stands open to metaphorical application. To ghoulish, therefore, we add instructive. Not all groups that might be thought akin to Project Race, however, have traveled the same road, set the same goals, or reached the same conclusions. The logic to be examined now pertains to that organization and is not necessarily representative. Even Project Race did not begin with blood. It launched itself with the claim that the new census classification would help to prevent mistaken diagnoses and thus save lives. In the early 1990s, a researcher repeatedly asked activists how a state-sponsored racial classification could possibly accomplish any such thing. No one preferred an answer. Indeed, no one seemed to have thought much, if at all, in terms of workaday cause and effect. What seems to have mattered was the thought structure of racecraft, which readily dispenses with material causality. Within it, the notion of a race dovetails with the folk notion that different races of people have differently constituted bodies and correspondingly different susceptibilities to illness. Whereas Jefferson cited that notion as a rationale for deporting freed slaves, its deployment today with the rationale of saving lives lends a benefic beneficent veneer to folk racism. Indeed, the will to beneficence may explain how the census classification 
Hispanic was not a race in 2003, but by 2007 had become the object of the taxpayer-funded Latino Genetics Study, which called for testing to identify genetic tendencies and illnesses and disorders among Hispanics. By fall 1996, Project Race believed in blood types called ethnic and biracial multiracial. Their efforts in the national campaign to encourage Americans to register as bone marrow donors appeared on a bulletin entitled Urgent Medical Concerns. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at top right of the screen speaks as he did in 1966, arguing for Medicaid. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. Thirty years later, his memory and his words are annexed by self-inventing new minority campaigning for the multipli multiplication of racism rather than its uprooting, the antithesis of what King stood for. The bulletin warns the organization's members that donors for multiracial people are rare because of the need for racial and ethnic matching. The truth is that matching is individual, tragically so when, as in about 70% of cases, close relatives and even false siblings of the patient cannot provide a match. The bulletin's blood talk teeters on the edge of letting members imagine that they would be helping to prepare especially labeled supplies. Pernicious falsehood seldom advertises its pedigree. Who would have thought at this late date that people would conceive a hankering to rehabilitate racist, racist subcategories that were born centuries ago in every New World slave society except the United States, which made do with a categorical black-white distinction, or would turn to primitive fascination with blood as a mystical symbol of group membership and to genealogical investigation reminiscent of the Estatutos de Limpieza de Sangre, that once identified Jews for persecution in Spain and Spanish America. Yet it is today's news. In early 2009, the Project Race Organization's website editorialized about two pending bills that it supported as components of a single agenda. One, the California School Racial Equality Designation Act, outlined a way for any educational system to allow biracial and multiracial children the respect and dignity they deserve. The other, the California Umbilical Cord Collection Program, had general application, but it would also help save the lives of multiracial children and adults as a medical program similar to bone marrow donation. On April 24th of that year, the California Assembly passed AB 52 with wording that, or AB 52 being the one about the umbilical cord collection, um, with wording that, without fully endorsing the bogus medical claims, allowed the activists to declare victory. It passed AB 1281 as well, which is the one about the California School Racial Equality Designation Act, allowed the activists to declare, or sorry, it passed AB 1281 as well, and advertising the presence of six multiracial employees in his office, the politician who godfathered AB 52 implied that those employees would share in the life-saving medical benefits. The suggestion was nonsense. Like the far more numerous people of mixed descent not classified as multiracial, those employees will be saved from nothing by this pastiche of last headline science and make-believe genetics. Set aside the medical nonsense, though, and notice the wide-awake shrewdness applied to repackaging the stuff of nightmares. This purposefully encoded, politically deployed racecraft serves as, as a reminder that what depends on imagination and action is more flexible than nature and has the power to create a quasi-nature more convincing than nature itself. How Americans Look this tour began with aspects of racecraft that depend on what another person looks like at a glance to a viewer observing quickly and superficially. Deference rules, variable sumptuary codes, mistaken shootings by police, and border monitoring of segregated spaces all stand in reference to a person as a seen object. That reference entails besides a seeing object and of course a seeing subject. 
These varied sightlines of racecraft are not separate phenomena. They occur together or in rapid sequence and in constantly shifting perspective. To conclude, therefore, our tour examines in close up the intimate yet public practices that organize individual perception of physical appearance, including one's own as subject. If physical appearance belonged to nature, it would be no more meaningful to a casual viewer than the pattern of stripes on a zebra's back. In fact, Americans observe themselves and each other through their own eyes and those of others, all the while classifying and evaluating. Thus, racecraft has an inner horizon that turns out to be densely populated with sometimes peculiarly selected physical traits. A living person to be met, to be met presently ascribes meaning to the shape of his jawbone, and Jefferson preferred the skin color of white people with its fine mixtures of red and white to that of black people, that external monotony, that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions. That veil of black can also unleash emotions, as happened when the portrait of a dark-skinned woman appeared on the cover of a scholarly journal. The artist intended to illustrate an article about the morally destructive content of Aunt Jemima as a representation of Afro-American women. As provocative as the essay was in content and form, the image proved to be more so. The artist had painted a young black woman standing or seated nowhere in particular, with a skin color, nose, lips, and stocky build that many black women have. She had tied her hair with a colorful scarf, as black women, and not only black women, often do, especially on bad hair days. She wore no lipstick and no smile, and her remarkable eyes looked straight ahead with a neutral expression. What she might be thinking and what to think about her, the artist left to the viewer's imagination. The viewers did indeed imagine. Many who wrote to protest, black and white, saw a reinforcement of the very stereotype that the author had set out to overthrow. The author of the article herself objected to the illustration, writing that the Aunt Jemima logo in some form would have been a more accurate image. In fact, the young woman of the cover is unlike the Aunt Jemima of the pancake box. Aunt Jemima is middle-aged wears lipstick, smiles, and is understood to be at work in someone's kitchen. Um, oh, so what sparked the commotion? One correspondent hinted at a truth that the others avoided, that the artist's unsmiling young woman was too dark-skinned to refute the caricature. To succeed, though, a racist caricature must have the viewer's assent to its point of view. Neither the pancake box image nor the portrait can mark dark skin in and of itself, hard to look upon. The viewer must bring that reaction to the picture, or for that matter, to a real person. Physical features simply are what they are, but they are also what they can become in a workaday encounter, in a grocery line, taxi, country club pool, and so on, or indeed in a police operation like the one that ended in tragedy when a white police academy graduate killed his black, black classmate having failed to recognize him. In that dreadful instance, split-second judgment explosively merged a person with a stereotype. That judgment exposed parts of racecraft's inner horizon that inhabit perception itself. Our tour ends on an internet site where Americans can be overheard thinking aloud about perception. Does physical appearance register ancestry, and if so, how? An undecided question appeared at answers.yahoo.com in April 2008 at the height of that year's presidential primary election. Why do Caucasian people have ethnic traits sometimes? We neither analyze nor edit the responses, but simply note that most respondents posed further questions such as, do I look fully Caucasian in these pictures? I don't have a Hispanic-like jaw, I have a Caucasian jaw, why? Why is there full Hmong people with Caucasian features such as blonde, reddish hair, colored eyes, etc.? Are freckles Caucasian traits? The best answer to the last question decided by vote was no, it's not, for which its contributor, Bad Habby, offered proof by signing off as Black and Rican with freckles. In mixed race people, why are Caucasian traits expressed less than the other racist traits? 
I'd like to understand why genes seem to be subordinate or submissive when they mix with another racial group. I've been curious about this for a long time. Why do Caucasians have a wider range of physical traits like hair color and texture and eye color than other races? A reply from overeducated redirects the conversation. Maybe because all these white supremacists, although I'm white, are wrong in thinking the Caucasian race is a single pure race. Maybe the Caucasian race is a little more mixed up than they'd like to admit. Three months later, an answer came from Richard Yo, who in the meantime had looked up Caucasian in a reference book. Here's the anthropology definition of or being a major human racial classification traditionally distinguished as very light to brown skin pigmentation and straight to wavy hair, and including peoples indigenous to Europe, Northern Africa, Western Asia, and India, no longer in scientific use. Therefore, he concludes, it covers a wide variety of people. It's to be expected that they would have a wide, wider range of physical traits. Alongside this exchange, an unidentified questioner in the sidebar wonders, once you are born, can you genetically change your eye color or hair color genes? Taking up the subject of variation, 68 Charger suspected that we are the most mixed race, but have no facts to substantiate that claim. Maybe someone more knowledgeable than myself will. King of Sexy Town rejoined, Maybe we are all one race, and the range of physical traits is just that wide. Here speaks only humane. Let us let us go back to the beginning. Let's take Adam. Adam was created from the earth from the lightest hue to the darkest, the smooth, smoothest to the roughest. We are children of Adam and Eve. Eve was also created from Adam, one of his ribs. So knowing that, in my opinion, it leads me to believe that we are all related, all races, regions and climates can contribute for our own our sorry can contribute for our more distinctive features but the features of some race groups can come out at any time in any race i think it's god's way of reminding us who's in control just the thought in his study of european witchcraft from the vantage point of 19th century britain W.E.H. Lecky sought to identify the moment when the idea of absurdity began to travel alongside stories of old women riding on broomsticks. The moment when the improbability of such stories could be felt at long last. What seemed obviously true to his long dead historical subjects seemed as odd to him in his day as it does to Americans of the present. Since our task is to look forward from today's America, we try in the coming chapters to put on display the oddness of social beliefs and practices that Americans continue to take for granted, to show where they come from historically and to share the clues we have about how they work. We conclude that racecraft has nothing to recommend it or to redeem it as truth about the world. Accordingly, we invite our fellow Americans to explore how the falsehoods of racecraft are made in everyday life in order to work out how to unmake them. Once we Americans learn to see them for what they are, we can make sense of our past and therefore of our present. Then we may at last be ready to write a new chapter.